Okay, so it's now eight o'clock, both in Sweden and New Zealand. So that means that we should start. Welcome everyone to the 2020 Oscar Klein Memorial Lecture and a special welcome and good morning to this year's lecturer and receiver of the Klein Medal, Professor Roy P. Kerr. Uh, my name is uh, Edvard Merchell and I'm one of the members of the Oscar Klein Committee, together with uh, Laurus Torlasius and Bo Sundborg, that I will soon give the word to. So this is the 33rd lecture in this series, and it's the first one that we give online. Uh, we'll try to make the best of this situation that in fact has some advantages. It allows for a large and worldwide audience and it also saves uh, Roy and the environment from a very long flight, of course. Uh, some practical information. Uh, first, Bo will introduce Oscar Klein and Professor Kerr. And after this, we will leave the word uh, to Professor Kerr for his lecture. And after the lecture, there will be a question session. If you have a question, please write it down in the Zoom chat. You should be able to find that uh, below here, the chat button. Please uh, uh, write down your question there and feel free to sign with your name and also location if you want. And then with the help of uh, a few people, Francesco Torsello, Marcus Högos and uh, Jonas Enander, uh, we will pick out questions and we will read out as many as we will have time for at the end of this session. And with that, I will leave the word and the screen to Bo. Uh, yes. Uh, we gather here on in this Zoom meeting to celebrate physics in memory of Oscar Klein. And my first talk task is to remind you of his role in physics. Oscar Klein was a Stockholm physicist in my grandmother's generation, but more importantly, he was a young physicist in Copenhagen in the 20s, 100 years ago, when modern physics was born. At this point, I, I can't resist mentioning an episode that reminds us about parallel to our own times and pandemics, which makes us meet in this way, of course, on Zoom. Uh, when Oscar Klein was young, the pandemic was called the Spanish flu. Oscar Klein had started out as a trainee with Bohr in Copenhagen before the summer of 1918. I wanted to show you this slide first, which is, of course, uh, is depicting what we are meeting for, the memorial lecture uh, held by Roy Kerr. And you can see the medal, which is will be on the, is, its way to Professor Kerr. Um, Oscar Klein had started out as a trainee with Bohr in Copenhagen just before the summer of 1918. He left Copenhagen to ski in Sweden in the end of 1918. But because of the Spanish flu that ravaged in Scandinavia at that time and Klein contract, contracted the flu, his journey back was considerably delayed. And not until the beginning of the summer of 19. 1919, Klein was back with Bohr in Copenhagen. Now in November the same year, 1919, he re returned to Sweden to work on his doctoral thesis. Bohr actually traveled to Stockholm in 1920 to visit Klein, it was 100 years ago, and convinced Klein to return to Copenhagen once more to do work at Bohr's Institute. He then started on the research which led to his first paper in theoretical physics on collisions of electrons and atoms. At the time, it was believed that electrons colliding with atoms always lost energy, 
But Klein, together with the Norwegian astronomer Rosalind, introduced collisions where electrons also could gain energy. Now, this time, the 20s in Copenhagen, Klein and was not a spectator to the events when uh, modern physics started. He contributed to many other developments of lasting importance. So you can see them here, Kaluza Klein theory. Hmm? Yeah, it's lasting, but we don't know if it has to do with the reality, could have. Klein-Gordon equation definitely has, in terms of describing the Higgs field. Jordan Klein second quantization, Yes, definitely. That is uh, quantization of fields uh, in more modern language. The Klein Nishina formula on scattering and the Klein par paradox that shines a light on the properties of the re relativistic quantum physics. In celebrating physics, through Klein's work, we are luck lucky to have a long list of illustrious Klein lecturers since the first lecture in 1988, as you can see here. Uh, in recent years, we have seen gravitation theory and its ultimate representatives, which, is, which are black holes, enter the main stage of physics. We have seen the rise of different ways to detect them and to learn about them observationally, but what are they? Well, typically we expect these exceptional objects to conform to the Kerr solution of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Almost everything isolated and sufficiently massive will collapse gravitationally, it will eventually approach a universal space-time. This space-time is called the Kerr solution because it was found by Professor Roy Kerr. So now it is um, my great pleasure to introduce the speaker for the 2020 Oscar Klein Memorial Lecture and recipient of the Oscar Klein Medal, Roy Kerr, Emeritus Professor at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand Today I'm going to talk about two things. The first one is, are there any singularities inside black holes? And the second one is uh, the two-body problem in relativity. I'll first explain the geometry of a black hole or of the Kerr solution to one. As you probably know, there's an event horizon around it. Uh, in fact, there are two horizons. The outer event horizon is exactly like the event horizon around a Schwarzschild black hole. You can go through it from the outside to the end. You cannot get back. The inner one is a bit more mysterious. It's not really an event horizon. It's uh, what's called a Cauchy surface. What this means is that inside that, whatever happens, nothing get, no information about it gets out. So, now, the Kerr solution has no matter inside it. So something has to generate the geometry, and that is this ring in the center. That's a singular ring, but it's got nothing to do with physics. It's purely what drives the geometry of Kerr. Actually, if you were to fall down the axis here, in this solution, with no matter inside, you'd go straight through that ring into another universe uh, where you could be happier, I don't know. But, uh, it's definitely not recommended. So what are the equations like? Well, <clears throat> the first thing I should explain is geodesics. In general relativity, particles travel along, small particles travel along the ge uh, geodesic in the external metric. And this is basically the shortest distance between two points is thought of as a geodesic. In general relativity, in some situations, is actually the longest time. But anyway, 
if you're traveling along a geodesic, uh, you can keep uh, track of the time with your watch. And that will tell you how far along the geodesic you've gone. There's no problem measuring distance along a uh, time-like geodesic because of, of the watch. But massive particles have got a real problem because uh, any distance is of traveling along a light-like geodesic, the distance between two points is zero. The distance along a light-like geodesic is zero. So how can you uh, measure your distance along it? Well, there's only been one suggestion that I know of, and that's the so-called affine parameter. What this is, is you start with a, a vector at one point on the geodesic, and you parallel propagate it along, and that gives you some sort of measure of time. The trouble is, as we'll see, it's not a very good measure. Now, where did the Kerr metric come from? I started looking for all solutions of Einstein's equations for which the Riemann tensor had a very special property. The Riemann tensor in an Einstein space has got four principal null directions. That's like four eigenvalues of a matrix. In uh, some spaces, these are not all distinct. In a general space, they'll all be distinct. So you'll have these four light-like directions that are picked out by the curvature tensor. <clears throat> in Schwarzschild, there's only two vectors because they double up. There's two vectors pointing inwards of, into the, uh, down the axis of a Schwarzschild solution, two pointing outwards. I was looking for all spaces, all Einstein spaces, which had a repeated root like this. And uh, that meant in order to set up the equations, I had to introduce coordinates. And like everybody else, the first coordinate I introduced was an affine parameter along the null curves, along these special null directions, the principal null direction. So that's why we've got to keep note of the coordinate r, which is this affine parameter along these special directions. Okay, so what about the equations? Well, I thought I'd bamboozle you a science here by putting up different uh, coordinate systems for, uh, for a Kerr metric. The first one is the most used now, Problem, in my belief, a mistake, but nevertheless it is. And it looks a bit like Schwarzschild's. It's got, a, it's got three squares, four squares added together. These two only involve time and angle. Now, my solution is invariant under a rotation. It's a rotationally symmetric body. It's also time invariant. So T and phi are uh, uh, actually killing directions. R, R and theta are where the real action is. R is the, this, this affine parameter along a null curve. It also measures the distance into the center. Well, it's close to a distance. Theta is what you would expect. It's just an, it's a, an angle which says, uh, well, which the metric actually is a function of. So the metric's a function of r and theta, but not of phi and t. Now, this delta, r squared minus 2mar plus a squared, a is a measure of the angular momentum of the solution, the rotation. It's, it's what distinguishes my solution from Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild has no angular momentum. It's a spherically symmetric body just sitting there like a big dummy doing nothing. 
Okay, my solution is spinning like crazy. Uh, Schwarzschild, you, this could be Schwarzschild, except that you'd have to put A equal to zero. The angle of momentum for this is M, which is the mass, times A. So <coughs> for Schwarzschild, this function here would be R squared minus 2MR, which is R times R minus 2M. And you may know that in Schwarzschild, the event horizon is at R equals 2M when this is zero. Similarly in Kerr, when delta is zero, you get one over zero here, which is definitely not liked. That's where the event horizons are, where delta equals zero. So there are two of them. <coughs> okay. Now that's the boyer lindquist coordinate system. It's not how Kerr was, the Kerr solution was found. When I found the solution, it was in what are called Kerr-Shill coordinates. Uh, what the problem with the boyer lindquist is there seems to be a singularity where this capital delta equals zero. And people talk about firewalls on the boundary and all sorts of weird things like that. In fact, there's nothing physically happening at the boundary except if you cross it and you won't know you're crossing it, you're gone. You cannot get back out. That's all. Okay, you are forced to keep falling towards the center if you cross that boundary. So <coughs> the Kerr solution has got two special directions. I said there are four special directions in general. For Kerr they, and for Schwarzschild, they coalesce in pairs. One's pointing out one pair, and the other's pointing in. Now, for Schwarzschild, they point basically in the same direction, straight down the axis. For Kerr, they're pointing at angles away from each other. One is coming is falling in, one is trying to get out as best it can. The transform, uh, how we transform from that to the Kerr shield is that we uh, basically change the time by adding a function of R onto it, which means we're pulling everything either back down the time axis or up the time axis. We're doing also doing a bit of rotation in one or in either direction in order to straighten out the lines that are coming out. Because if in Boyer Lindquist, if you have if you follow a geodesic going in, it starts going round and round and round the uh, uh, the axis just before it gets to the event horizon. And similarly, the ones that are coming out are going like crazy round and round and round the axis and finally working their way out. Now, <coughs> in these Kerr-Shill coordinates, they, uh, the, uh, these directions are straightened out. They're now, the metric is put in the form of its flat space. This is the flat space metric. I've just transformed to Cartesian type coordinates, plus a multiple of a vector. And the vector happens to be a light like vector, both in the full metric and in the flat space. So this is a very convenient form because this is the only linear or actually affine approximation to, to the equations of relativity. You see here, it's flat space plus m times the square of a vector. Okay, the inverse metric is flat space minus the square of a vector. Uh, the determinant of this metric is minus one, which, uh, means that uh, it's very easy to do things with. Okay, so there are two of these forms. There's the outward going 
curse yield and the end going. Now, normally people work with the end going because stuff that's falling in goes straight through that barrier and straight to the middle. Okay. Now, wh what I'm going to show is that uh, these ingoing geodesics, or sorry, the outgoing geodesics behave in a fairly strange way. Uh, okay, we're going to look down the axis where x is zero, y equals zero, and z equals r. When I talk about the axis, let's go back to the picture, down that red line. Okay, now forget everything inside there, inside here, because that's where the, uh, uh, the physical body that caused this outward metric is located, and we don't know a lot about it. Uh, you can forget all this, but we're going to go down the axis between the outer and inner horizons. Okay. Now, <coughs> on the axis, we know that the principal null directions must point down the axis. They are rotated elsewhere, but there's no rotation at the axis. So uh, the prin these principal geodesics are actually just the solutions on the axis of ds squared equals zero. And remember, R is an affine parameter here. I said that at the start. That was the, where the, all of this algebraically special stuff from the Kerr solution came from, was right at the beginning, the coordinate R was an affine parameter. Okay, so we've got the, what we find is that if we solve this equation for dr by dt, then dr by dt is R squared minus 2MR plus A squared over something that's positive. So for dr by dt to be zero at any point, r has to be a solution of this equation. So the, uh, there are two geodesics. Actually, what, what you've got in there is one of the geodesics is the light falling in from outside, if you like. It's going fast towards the center. The other geodesic, somebody has uh, decided to shine a torch out towards the outside uh, as you fall down. The light from the torch can't get out. It, it continues to fall in these coordinates, but it's for the person who's holding the torch, the torch beam is going up. So that's what I call the slow geodesic. It's the slow light ray. It's the slight, it's the, it's like the, uh, he's scrabbling along on the wall, trying to stay up there, but he's falling in and will eventually reach the inner horizon. Now, the slow one is compelled to move inwards. Now, what happens is if we, if we plot the r by dt as a function of uh, r or t, I don't know, r, yeah. then uh, inside the inner horizon, it's positive. Between the two horizons, it's negative. Outside the whole the particle, it's positive. So that means that inside, between the two horizons, that light ray is going backwards. What happens at these points? Well, these are critical points of the differential equation. From on this side, the light is trying to go that way. On this side, the light's going that way. In fact, it can't cross that there. So this, any light ray, any slow light ray down the axis, is eventually going to get to a point where its velocity stops. Okay. 
and that's its finishing point. Now, wherever it starts, its affine length is no more than r. Well, it's, sorry, it's no more than r plus minus r minus this difference. Okay, why are we interested in that? Well, that brings us to the Rayshaduri equation. Every attempt in 57 years to prove that there are singularities inside the Kerr metric has used the Rayshaduri equation. What is this? Well, I'm not going to write it out. But what it looks at is neighboring rays, uh, like like rays which start very close together. Okay, it's what so called pencil of rays. That's these, this is pretty exaggerated, of course, but these are neighboring rays. Now, the ratio Dury equation shows that they will, these will converge and meet somewhere in the future. It's <coughs> this depends upon two things. You have to have some sort of classical uh, assumptions about the energy momentum tensor along it. And these, uh, it doesn't matter which ones they are, they're all classical from 19th century physics and probably have very little to do with what is going on in these situations. But we'll give, we'll allow for these classical approximations. Now, this assumes that light rays must continue to r equals infinity or some or cross. So the ratio Dury equation says eventually these will cross, but this this assumes that all light rays have infinite affine parameter or have a singularity. Now, I just showed you this in Kerr. There are light rays which have finite affine parameter. In fact, not just the ray going through the center, but down the axis, this principal null direction that's trying to escape, not only is that a finite length, all the similar rays that are coming in at angles, passing through the event horizon and hitting eventually the other Cauchy surface, they have uh, they have exactly the same R for them. So they take the difference between the two R's is how long they've got to live in there. So, <coughs> uh, and these actually were the the rays that people used to prove there were singularities. Now, it's been 57 years since I found my solution. And in 57 years, nobody has proved there's a singularity inside a spinning black hole. Uh, several have proved theorems like uh, the one where it says that either there's a singularity or the, there's a array of finite affine length. People took this to mean there were singularities because they assumed there were, that every, every ray had an infinite length or had a singularity. Now, what I'm saying is none of these theorems are proving anything because of the fact that there are rays of finite length. The um, Okay, <laughs> I thought I'd show how bad the Kerr solution is inside to represent what's happening. I think if you have a something like a giant star that is, uh, has gone supernova and now it's collapsing down to a neutron star, or if it's too big, it will form a black hole, if you've got something like that, presumably you have a blob of matter which gradually is rotating faster and faster as it shrinks. It <coughs> will continue from the outer horizon towards what, in my solution, is the inner horizon, which may or may not exist in a real situation. It will continue to the, there. The reason it doesn't continue contracting like in Schwarzschild is the angular momentum. 
angular momentum, the, the force of the angular momentum counteracts the force of gravity, just the Newtonian force, pulling the body inwards. And so you, you eventually reach some sort of equilibrium. And we can actually see from the Kerr singular ring that the that this equilibrium occurs when the matter on the outside edge is traveling close to the velocity of light. So it's relative to the center. So that's the blob field. Now, what this inner horizon is, is a very unstable region. So what this means is that uh, uh, even a bit of motion can towards cause violent motions on the boundary. So remember, nothing inside the inner region can affect what's outside. <coughs> I should say here that uh, the, uh, oh, I forget what I was going to say, so I won't say it. Okay, so now what suppose you had two bodies, two very slowly rotating Schwarzschild type bodies, but with a bit of rotation to stop them being singular at the center. As they rotate around each other, they start to collapse inwards. They, they lose energy by radiation as infinity. So they get closer and closer and closer till eventually. Now, the Schwarzschild radius of this one is approximately 2m. Let's suppose they're the same size. This one's 2m, also the Schwarzschild radius. Add that together, they're touching roughly at, at a 4m radius. Well, lo and behold, that's about the radius of the, of the resultant curved black hole. So numerical relativity and everything we know says that as these event horizons approach each other, now remember, event horizons aren't meaningful. In this situation, what this means is that if you're here, you are going to fall towards that black hole. If you're here, you're falling, you're inside its event horizon, if you like, you're falling towards, in between them, God only knows where you go. If you're too close to this one, in there, too close to this one, in there. <laughs> the, where is the uh, inner horizon? Does it even exist? I doubt it. The closest thing to the inner horizon is a bifurcate horizon, possibly around the, this body and possibly around that. So we don't really know what it's like in there. But this is the problem I'm going to talk about next, is the two-body problem. Okay, how am I going for time? <coughs> so, how do you solve the two-body problem? Well, in Newton's physics, it's pretty easy, and you teach it in uh, an undergraduate course in, relative, in uh, physics how to solve the two-body problem. In general relativity, there's no exact solution for the two-body problem. The equations are far too complicated. So the best you can do is set up a recursive system. Now, what does that mean? So you suppose that the metric, and I might say for technical reasons, people don't use G, U, U, the ordinary metric, they usually use a metric density with the indices up top. It makes the equation simpler. They assume it can be expanded in a series of terms. That's fine. And substitute it into the Einstein equations and <coughs> collect the terms of various orders and uh, see if they can solve them. This is what Einstein, Enfelds, and Hoffman did in 30, 1939, just before World War II. The, uh, what 
what they did was they took the first equation and said, gee, we can solve them. The field is basically an M over R term, just like in Schwarzschild. So that went great. Then they uh, started solving the, second, the more and more equations. The problem was that they quickly discovered that instead of finding that the mass times acceleration equals the Newtonian force or an equivalent as a first approximation, what they found was the mass times acceleration equals zero and the Newtonian force has to equal zero. Well, that was obviously ridiculous. I mean, they knew it. They knew they should add them together. They spent, uh, well, in Infeld in particular spent pretty much the next 20 years of his life mainly trying to show how, why you should be able, able to add these terms and why they weren't individual equations. That somehow mass times acceleration equals the force. <clears throat> the, prob the problem was, and this is where I came in in uh, 1957, 58, as a graduate student, I saw this problem. And what I realized was that uh, it wasn't a straight, simple expand out the equations, e equate the terms to zero. You had to simultaneously say, not only does the metric satisfy an increasingly more complicated equation, which we correct at every step, but also the derivative of the mass has to be expanded in a, in a series too, in this indeterminate parameter. Also the uh, spin tensor and the uh, acceleration of the particles. So instead of just evaluating the metric as you go along, you have to evaluate the, I don't know what you call the, uh, the force on the mass at uh, these terms, the, the coupling terms, so I thought I'd call that C on the spin, and the force terms which cause the acceleration. Okay, so you, have, you, you don't have a simple system of a metric like that which you're solving for. You have to simultaneously evaluate these equations. Now, what that means is that at each step, you take what you know, these equations to whatever order you've calculated, you take the metric that you've calculated to some order, you plug it into the Einstein equations, and you calculate the next term. Now, but in that plugging it into the equation, you use these equations to get rid of time derivatives of the physical quantities. Uh, <coughs> that solved all the problems that Infeld had been having at that time. Also, uh, they, Einstein and Infeld and Hoffman had, had shown that to get the equations of motion at the next order, you didn't actually have to solve for the field of that order. There was a certain surface integral around each of the bodies, which had to be zero. And that gave you, well, in, I would say it gave you the correction to these various equations, in particular to that one and that one. It gave you a correction to them. Now, I showed that there was uh, another set of invariant surface integrals, which gave you the, the spin coupling forces. Uh, so there were these two things. Okay. So there were two main methods. Everybody has to follow that procedure. Okay. Evaluate the corrections to the forces as you're progressing, not just evaluate the corrections of the field. Uh, now, everybody at that time 
including me, was using the radiation gauge, G mu nu comma nu equals zero, as a coordinate condition, because in relativity, you can always change your coordinates. So you've got a problem there. Okay, how am I going for time, babe? Uh, so if you use the radiation gauge, then in the einstein infeld hoffman or what's now called post-Newtonian post approximation, which most people use, uh, the linear operator in the equations reduces to just del squared of g mu nu, the, the uh, Laplace operator. And people, we all know how to solve equations. Del squared of something equals something. You know, they're standard methods, so that's pretty easy. In the fast approximation, where you, where, in the einstein infeld hoffman approximation, they assumed everything was moving very slowly and they could forget about time derivative. In the fast approximation, they couldn't do that. So then the operator reduces to the block operator or wave operator, whatever the thing is called. Now, <coughs> People keep using the same coordinates step after step. What I showed in 58 was that you could change these conditions from step to step. You could use any conditions you like to solve the equation. In fact, you can take a wild stab in a seventh order and say, looking at this horrible equation, uh, oh, I see a solution there. I'll use that. Now, what? gauge condition does it satisfy? Who cares? It solves the equations. So the gauge conditions are a bit of a red herring. Now, <coughs> why do I say that? Because when the only situation where we really care about the two body problem is two black holes or possibly two neutron stars coalescing. That would be interesting too. But it's these very tight, very specific bodies that we're interested in. Okay, so what's the best starting point for a black hole? What's the best linear approximation to one? I know, why don't we use Kirchhoff? Because that is already not only a linear approximation, it's an exact approximation. And I love exact approximations where perhaps you've got everything right there in front, linear in the mass. Now, why the outgoing curse shield? Because here's the real problem. A, a billion light years or more away is a pair of black holes coalescing. Now that's a long way, a billion light years. What's the distance between them as they're getting close in? 10,000 uh, kilometers, kilometers, not light years. Uh, very small. Even a 60 mass black hole, its diameter is uh, oh, four, four times, three times, 60, whatever that is, 240, 1,000. Okay, so it's got a diameter of less than a thousand miles. Two of them, when they're close in, say they're only thousands of miles apart, and we are a billion light years from this. So what we're looking at is the asymptotic field. We're looking, if we had gravitational eyes instead of electromagnetic eyes, we would look down these two rays coming from these two black holes very close together, and we would be looking at the, the asymptotic field there. I mean, that, that is a, a very small angle. <coughs> so what I'm saying is the best first approximation is outgoing curve, not ingoing. Outgoing. The one thing about outgoing is, what's it coming from? Well, it's taken forever to get away from the event horizon, but you're pretty much looking in back into prehistory there. You're looking at the 
<coughs> the body that formed the black hole just as it collapses into the event horizon. Well, <coughs> so what we want to do is take the curve, the metric flat space plus the square of a null vector for one particle, take, add on another particle, a square of a null vector. That's the two bodies you've got. And <coughs> now, what you, it's now you're starting with an ex, this, with constant mass and constant spin, etc. like as true for Kerr as the first approximation. Because as I said, what we're interested in is how the mass and the spin develop in the future as they start rotating around each other. The, um, uh, so what we do is we take Kerr and we put M as a function, which is basically depends on how long it took light to get to it. So if I'm here and it's over there, the time, the, what I'm seeing is that star a few, well, not, actually it was just over there, not a hell of a long time ago because light travels really fast. But at, a, at uh, you know, thousands of light years, what we're looking at is the, the body a long time in the past. So I have to replace M by a function of R, the spin by a function of R, the radial distance from the particle, and which is exactly what one does in the Minkowski approximation scheme. Okay, so this is a pretty much a copy of the Minkowski fast motion approximation scheme. <coughs> if we don't do that, what we end up is complete rubbish at infinity because the we will be looking at the We can't see the object now. We have to see the uh, be looking at the object back in this past. So that's that's the start of the Kerr shield approximation scheme. You have these now. It resembles the Minkowski approximation scheme, and in fact, I believe I wrote the first paper in 1958 on fast motion approximation scheme and derived the equations for two spinning bodies uh, together. But I, I was looking at everything moving fast, so one whipping past the other fast. That's not what we're interested in here. We're looking at relatively slow motion as they rotate around each other, not one coming by from infinity and dashing out to the other side. Uh, the uh, what I got there was similar to the results of Papa Petru. In 1951, he looked at a small body, a test particle, they call it, traveling next to a larger body. Well, and they're actually just traveling in a gravitational field, an external field. And <clears throat> he got the equations for acceleration. If it wasn't spinning, it just moved along a geodesic in the external field. If it was spinning, there were spin couplings which drove it away from the geodesic, and they depended upon the curvature tensor. I got essentially the same results for the two-body problem. Each moved on the geodesic of the other, except for the spin coupling. Okay, so my, my equations agreed with this. What's going to happen with uh, the uh, Kershaw approximation is undoubtedly the same thing. Each of the two bodies in the first non-trivial approximation will move uh, on a geodesic of the other modified by the spin forces. Uh, if we know the motion a billion light years away, 
we can calculate the, ex the uh, fields near us, <coughs> but it's the asymptotic limiting field. And that, I believe, will be given completely by the, the way these two bodies rotate around each other. Using other coordinate systems, people have to somehow tie the, what's going on at the center which, with what is going on at infinity. And that's a difficult job, requires all sorts of expansions. I think it's going to come out rather, rather easily in this because we're setting up the system to suit the problem, not setting up a problem and then deciding what the system's going to do. <coughs> the, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, conclusions, I think. Yeah, it must be. I get 45 minutes to talk, and I haven't the vaguest idea how long I've been talking. Uh, about right. Okay, singularities. Well, what can we say? Despite the 57 years that have elapsed since my solution was discovered, there's still no proof that rotating black holes contain singularities inside. Rayshaduri's equation has proved ineffective. By the way, Rayshaduri's equation was also used by Stephen Hawking to prove that there has to be a singularity back of us at the start, at the Big Bang. Uh, he's got the same problem that race, that uh, race Dury's equation doesn't do what they hope it does. Uh, <coughs> actually, the first time I met race Dury's equation was about 67, Stephen, who was still walking, but only just and was, had just graduated from Cambridge. He uh, came to Texas for a long weekend and he told us he had proved this theorem that if everything was hunky-dory now, in the future, you were either going to get a singularity or you were going to get a closed time-like loop. And he said he used Ray Sudori's equation. So I spent a couple of days he didn't tell us, give us any more details, just that he used Rayshaduri's equation. So I spent a couple of days seeing if I could prove this theorem for myself, where it would come from. And I wasn't able to. All I could prove was I could get back arbitrarily closely to where I started, but I couldn't close the loop. And I said this to him, look, I couldn't close the loop. But okay, I presumed he could. At a, at a party where he and George Ellis were. And uh, a few months later, his serum came out and it had changed from what he said he could prove to what I said I could prove. And uh, that was that. So that was the first failure of Ratio Dury's equation. Of course, if I had known, realized now that you can have finite affine parameter length rays that don't keep going to infinity then I'd have realized the whole proof was pointless. Okay. <coughs> this is the <coughs> Kirchhoff approximation. Okay, I goes looking straight down the outgoing geodesics from the two black holes. <coughs> so what we've got is this flickering motion there. What we do is we expand the ray at a, the rays at our point uh, to calculate the uh, the, the uh, time dependent perturbation that li the LIGO instruments are trying to observe and are observing brilliantly, unbelievably, physics that they can do there. Okay, now why did I think that we should have the Kershaw approximation? Well, a few years ago. I was in uh, Italy, and uh, Jose Rodriguez was a young graduate student. And Ramo Ruffini said to him, look, just look at the geodesics, uh, a simple test body moving around a, a central body, and see how whether you can get the same results as uh, all these people using more advanced methods. 
And so he did. He used the test body motion around, I think, Boyer Lindquist's form of Kerr. And after a week or so, and I, that's all it was, he worked very fast, he came back and said, yeah, he got to, very close to the results for a particular observation, a, a 65 mass, solar mass black hole and a 35 solar mass black hole coalescing, which had been observed. And he got very close to the same results as the LIGO team. <coughs> So and as soon as he said that, I said, the reason is it's Kerr-Schild. The Kerr-Schild approximation is that he wasn't using Kerr-Schild, but I thought behind it all was that uh, these black holes are just good linear approximations. And uh, <laughs> so I tried to talk them in into using Kerr-Schild, but um, they didn't. Anyway, there's another method, which is the equivalent one-body approach. And that, that says, well, look, it's a long way away. As far as I'm concerned, this is just a black hole form, okay? It's one body we're looking at, because you never, you'll never, if this was, these were light rays, you'd never resolve them at that distance. Can't resolve them. You know, thousands of miles at at a billion light years. So uh, the equivalent one body approach treats it as one body that's, that's forming a black hole. And <coughs> uh, anyway, I'm going to stop now before my throat gives out completely. And thank you for your attendance. And thank you, uh, the Klein Committee, for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So as I explained uh, before the lecture, uh, you now have the uh, possibility to post questions in the chat or through other channels. Uh, so I will start here. We will have time for a few questions here. Uh, so there is one question here that is asking about how does your results relate to this year's Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, uh, specifically Penrose's Singularity Theorem? Well, the singularity, as I said, all singularity theorems depend upon light rays having being allowed to continue to forever be, or hit a singularity. What I'm saying is light rays don't have this property. The affine parameter is not a good judge of distance along them. And even in Kerr itself, there are light rays of finite affine parameter lengths that don't end up in singularities. So any so-called singularity theorem does not prove that there are singularities inside Kerr. It proves that either there are singularities inside Kerr or there are light rays of finite affine length. And that's how Roger um, expressed his theorem. He was very specific about this. It was one or the other. Now, what I'm saying is, unfortunately, it's the other. There's no, there is now no proof that there is a physical singularity, a place where there's an infinite amount of, or a very large amount of mass in a very small volume inside a rotating black hole. So I can't say any more than that. Okay. Uh... No singularity. Thank you very much. Uh, we now also have a question from Philip Stamp. Uh, so the question is uh, about your view of the status of the singularities. Uh, so basically the question is, do you believe there are singularities inside the current event horizon and just so their existence has not been demonstrated? Or do you actually <laughs> believe that they are not there? 
I missed that question. Sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, I will repeat it. So the question is basically, do you believe that there are singularities inside the curve event horizon? Not only that they haven't been demonstrated, or do you actually not believe they are there? I don't believe there are any. I, what I believe is that if you look at the... Uh, suppose we're talking about a single blob that has formed this black hole, and that is... Uh, has collapsed down to the inner horizon. Now, I believe that the matter at the out at the equator is going to be traveling very close, very fast. And asymptotically, it might be traveling close to the speed of light. So this is the only place you get singularities. But unfortunately, you cannot accelerate matter to the speed of light. It takes an infinite amount of energy to get one electron even close to the speed of light. And when you've used all that energy up, it's still 300,000 miles per second slower than a light ray. You know, it, it can't be done. So what we're talking about is asymptotic. Uh, I, I don't know what's happening at the boundary, as I say, but I think that, uh, <coughs> oh, I, I should say, this region which we think of as the inner horizon, this Cauchy surface, is a very unstable region. What that means is if, if there's a bit of bubbling and boiling on the surface of this body, boy, it, the matter can go all over the place because it's, uh, it's, it's the turbulent instability of it all that's, that comes into play. Uh, look, people have had 57 years. Think how long that is. God, that's almost my lifetime. Uh, not quite. They've had 57 years to prove there's a black, there's a singularity inside a black hole, and they have failed abysmally to do it. That's what I'm saying. There is no theorem that says there is. Why should there be? Just because it seemed in Schwarzschild there was a singularity. Again, that's totally dependent upon point particles which can be shrunk to in to zero volume, which are already singular. So what, what's the universe full of singularities from their particles? Can particles be, be compressed down to an arbitrarily small volume? I don't know, uh, and nor does anybody else when it comes to that. So uh, this classical assumption that the energy momentum temperature is a smooth function for these bodies is a lousy assumption. It's trying to put 19th century physics into a 21st century, 21st century problem. Anyway, that's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Uh, suppose we, fi we, we find a singularity-free interior solution for the black hole. Do you think this could lead to any modifications of the exterior curve solution? so that it can actually be tested? Uh, <clears throat> nobody actually gives a damn what's inside a black hole because the last place I plan to go in the remaining years of my life is into any black hole that somebody discovers. That is a complete stay away from it area. Don't go close. And there were some beautiful theorems proved soon after I found my solution that said that that black holes have no hair. This was done by a New Zealander, David Robinson, one of the main people involved there. What that says is it's got mass, it's got spin, and it's got uh, angular momentum. Yeah, angular momentum, mass, and uh, charge. Thank you, charge. I, I knew it was something else. But it's, there's nothing else it can have. Okay. What that means is that whatever collapses down and forms this black hole, the outside forgets all its properties. If it had, you know, hills and mountains and parties going on, they're all gone for the outside. They cannot communicate from the inside to the outside. So 
the outside turns into curve. The inside, no, sorry, there's no, there's no theorem that says the inside is unique. And it doesn't matter because you could have an atomic bomb go off in the middle of the damn thing, which it was time to go off in a thousand years after it formed a black hole. Obviously, this would change what was inside. It would have no effect on the outside. So uh, what's inside is interesting, as long as it's got no singularities, but it's unknown. Okay, I also had, I got a few questions here about other black hole solutions, like Minkowski, Kern, Newman, if you think they have singularities. Uh, sorry, what was that about the Kern, Newman? Uh, uh, other, yeah. other black hole solutions, like Kern, Newman, or even Minkowski, ordinary Schwarzschild black holes, whether they have singularities or not. <laughs> there, look, given any theory, you can, not just Einstein's theory of gravity, but some other theory of gravity, you can look for black holes in, within that theory. There have been a number constructed. Uh, the, uh, the property that I think is most significant of, in Kerr is it's of kerr shield form. It's flat space plus the square of the null vector. Okay, and it's, it's linear. I mean, nonlinear theories are not supposed to have linear solution in which it's just something times this plus something times that, arbitrary parameters. So I, I think in any theory, you could look for similar curse hill solutions and that they would possibly contain black holes. Uh, everybody has to do something useful at a university apart from teaching and stuff like that. So uh, it's a good way to write a paper is to take in a theory and find a black hole in that theory. Uh, another thing to do is find other holes in the theory because that's different sorts of holes. Yeah, so I think there are other solutions. Uh, the interesting one was the uh, uh, Kern Newman, that uh, where the, where the Kerr Schuld metrics come in, which are generalizations of Kerr, but of a similar form, flat space plus the square of an old vector, is I was at a party in in 1964 uh, in uh, Texas, and Alfred was having a party from Jerry Pavansky. And uh, I heard them talking about solutions of this curse field form. And I said to them, oh, I don't know, but a couple of days ago, I looked in my equations for algebraically special spaces for generalizations of that type, flat space plus a square. And I said, I, I found a bunch, but they were all singular at infinity. And I just threw it in the waste paper basket uh, and didn't even check it. And so they were interested. So Alfred and I went into his office and we did a few little calculations and we found uh, that, uh, gee, if he had solutions like that, they had to be the sort that I had been looking at. So uh, possibly we already knew them all. Uh, that calculation was, was incredibly short, by the way. It's just we knew what to calculate and uh, the calculation of Alpha and I. And uh, so we went in next day and we checked what I'd done and turned out to be right, which meant that the calcula it, it could have all been expressed in half a dozen lines of calculations in a paper, except it depended on stuff which I hadn't published. And so we wrote a, things from first principles and it becomes very complicated from first principles. Those solutions, were like generalizations of Kerr. Soon after Christmas, I looked for charged ones of the same form, the Kerr shield charged one. And I found that it wasn't as straightforward in the simple case. We, the first thing we proved 
was that this special direction had to be a geodesic. It was a null geodesic. Wow, that really simplified things. Now, for the charge case, I couldn't prove that in the Curtis Schultz situation. So I assumed it was geodesic and plowed, plowed on. And then I got a couple of functions that everything depended on. And I couldn't get any further if one of the functions was non-zero. So I made it zero. OK. That gave me a charge that charged all of the Kershaw metrics, including Kerr, was charged right there. Then I gave the problem, the general problem, to a graduate student to look at uh, what happens if I don't make these assumptions, which is just sheer laziness. Um, and he went away, and we spent a couple of months on it and uh, didn't get anywhere with the general situation. And then uh, uh, Ted Newman made a brilliant guess of what the solution should look like for charge curve. So that's where it came from. The, uh, they, there are other charged black holes. Okay, they have singularities though that run to infinity. Okay, now I've said to some astronomers, not astrologers, uh, astrophysicists, <laughs> the same thing in some situations. Uh, I said to some of them, what about having a look at what this physically means? What, what is this singularity running to infinity? Now, <clears throat> nobody's ever taken it up on me, uh, probably because it's hard to see what it could be that's of interest because it's got to be time independent. It's not like it's feeding in and forming a jet. But I wondered if it could be a, a, the start of a jet. Uh, OK, next question. If I've answered the last one, it is. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will now, I will do three more questions, and then I think we should conclude in the interest of time. Uh, so here is one from my colleague in the Klein Committee, Bo Sundborg. Uh, light like geodesics with finite range of the affine parameter are intriguing. How does the wave equation behave in these regions? Sorry, I missed that question. My hearing is not so good. And so OK, I will repeat it. So this is about oh, light. Oh, how does the wave equation behave on the inner surface? Uh, God only knows I don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, you see, nobody really looks at pertur perturbations very much on the interior. But on that interior solution, solution everything is very unstable. And I would expect it to be a pretty much a nightmare there. That uh, certainly no waves are going backwards in time, up and out of a black hole. That's the problem. And uh, <coughs> does the surface even exist? Or is that a token surface inside this rotating body? I, I suspect it's, it's more of a token surface. And that what you've got is the outside of the body is gradually uh, sinking towards it, but not attaining it. And, uh, but it's still going to be very unstable. And any action on the surface is going to cause uh, a real mess. But it doesn't really matter, because we're never going to see it. So. Uh, OK. Hey. Thank you very much. Uh, second out of three questions. Uh, doesn't some of the curvature scalars diverge in a region inside the event horizon? Does the which? Uh, some of the curvature scalars. No, no, no. If the curvature scalar ever diverged, you would have a singularity. If it diverges to infinity. Uh, the curvature. The curvature 
for pure pur with no matter inside and with a silly singular ring in the center. At that point, the curvature scalars will go to infinity. Yeah, that's, that's exactly where you get uh, an infinity. At that point, all the light rays, these special light rays that are coming in from outside and are lying on, coming in on the uh, uh, equator plane, the plane of the equator, they are all tangential to that ring when they get to the ring. And so they are all basically crossing on the ring. And that's where the curvature becomes infinite. And possibly even Rogers' theorem and other theorems of that type would say, why it's singular there, because they cross. Um, the rest of the light rays, the bundle of light rays go through the ring into the other branch of the, of the curse solution. There's two branches. But uh, it's definitely singular on the ring. And the curvature scalars go to infinity. Thank you very much. Uh, so last question for tonight. Uh, so this is a question about uh, some of the early slides you had. Would you survive when traveling through the curved black hole to the other universe? Uh, there is no other universe. You're stuck with the one you've got, unfortunately. <laughs> so this, what you see is what you've got. That is a, a if, if a real Kerr solution existed uh, and you went down the axis of rotation into this other universe, um, you would survive if the black hole was large enough. And because otherwise the curvature would, would uh, cause severe headaches on the way through. Uh, if you're talking about a supermassive black hole, sorry, it's already, it's small enough even then, so I don't want to try going down the axis. No, this business of surviving as a strange, or not, it, with a black hole is a strange one. I could ask, if you decided to make a trip to the sun and hold a party on the surface, would you survive? Well, of course not. Nobody's going near the sun. We're not that stupid. So nobody goes near a black hole really close to it because we're not that stupid. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Roy, for a very interesting lecture and interesting answers to these questions. And with that, we conclude the 2020 Oscar Klein lecture. And uh, thank you all for being with us tonight. I say good night to the participants in Sweden and have a nice day, participants in New Zealand. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh,